And good morning, members. I'm going to call this meeting of the State Government Finance and Election Committee to order. It's February 1st, 2022. And pursuant to House Rule 1001, this meeting is being held virtually. Um, I'll ask the, um, the new committee aide, um, Benji, to take the roll. Great, thank you. Chair Nelson? I'm here. Chair Nelson is present. Vice Chair Carlson? Carlson present. Carlson is present. Representative Nash? Nash present. Nash is present. Representative Boehner? Representative Drazkowski? Present. Representative Drazkowski is present. Representative Elkins? Present. Representative Elkins is present. Representative Greenman. Present. Representative Greenman is present. Representative Cleborne. Present. Representative Cleborne is present. Representative Kosnick. Kosnick present. Representative Kosnick is present. Representative Mason. <laughs> present. Representative Mason is present. Representative New Brindley. Present. Representative New Brindley is present. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, present. Representative Pulowski is present. Representative Quam. Present. Representative Quam is present. Uh, Chair Nelson, we do have quorum. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Ben. Um, and before we get started here, I just want to introduce Benjamin Brinks. He's our new CLA. Um, Sydney, our previous CLA, got promoted to a, a, a committee administrator position in the House DFL caucus. So Benji will be taking care of us this year. Um, any, any inquiries on that go through him. Um, he does go by Benji. So um, with that, Benji, you want to tell us a little bit about a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I've been working in Minnesota politics for the past five years since I graduated from the University of Minnesota. Been doing a lot of campaign work across the state, working with um, various state representatives, senators, and mayors. I'm really excited to be here and to be part of the state government committee. Thank you, Benji. Um, with that, members, uh, we got two sets of minutes to approve. Um, we'll start with the May 7th, 2021 minutes. And uh, um, does somebody want to make a motion? Mr. Chair, I'll move the minutes. Uh, Representative Anders Carlson moves the minutes of May 20, May 7th, 2021. All those in favor, uh, if you want to mute yourself, say aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes for the May 7th are approved. The next set of minutes we have are from June 24th. 2021. Um, Representative Carlson, do you want to make the motion again? Yes, Mr. Chair, I move the minutes. Representative Carlson moves the minutes, approval of the minutes for May, excuse me, from June 24th, 2021. Um, all those in favor, again, unmute yourself and please say aye. 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 Oh, opposed? Minutes are approved. Um, just another note here. Uh, we have Representative Bonner is presenting a bill in judiciary this morning, so she'll join us when she's done with that. Um, that's why she would, she wasn't here for the um, roll call. Anyway, what we got to do here as members is at the beginning of the second year of the biennium, this is a standard practice, is the bills pursuant to House Rule 4.20, the bills are returned to the last committee that they were in that were on the general register. Um, and so we're going to move these bills. Again, these are bills that we've discussed and thoroughly discussed and passed in the past, last year and we moved to the general register. And so we're just going to move them back there for the fall, for the, this, this session. And I'll start with House File 152. Um, and I'll move that House File 152 to be referred to the general register. Um, this was a bill from Representative Jordan about the bill and Bonnie Daniels Firehouse Museum, and um, any dis any any minor discussion on this? If not, members, 
Uh, Benji, you want to take the roll? Yes, thank you, Chair Nelson. Uh, Chair Nelson? Aye. Vice Chair Carlson? Carlson, aye. Representative Nash? Nash, aye. Representative Bonner? Representative Drozkowski? Aye. Representative Elkins? Aye. Representative Greenman? Aye. Representative Cleborn? Aye. Representative Kosnick? Kosnick, aye. Representative Mason? Mason, aye. Representative New Brindley? Aye. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Representative Quam? Aye. Uh, the motion prevailed. Thank you, uh, Benji. Um, the next bill we have is House File 325, Representative Mason. It's about political subdivision compensation limits. Um, Representative Mason, do you want to move your bill to the general register? You're, you're muted. Um, she's having trouble getting herself unmuted. I'll move House File 325 to be referred. There we go, Representative okay. Mason. Okay, I move that we send it back to the floor. Thank you. Uh, motion is to move House File 325 back to the General Register. All in favor? Uh, again, uh, Rep uh, Ms. Benjamin, you want to take the, ro the roll? Yes. Chair Nelson? Aye. Vice Chair Carlson? Carlson, aye. Representative Nash? Nash votes no. Representative Bonner? Representative Drozkowski? No. Representative Elkins? Aye. Representative Greenman? Aye. Representative Cleborn? Aye. Representative Kosnick? Kosnick, no. Representative Mason? Mason, aye. Representative New Brindley? No. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Representative Quam? No. The motion prevailed. Thank you, Ben. Um, the next bill we have is House File 575. Representative Hewitt was the author. It's uh, Notary Public's Authorized to Perform Civil Marriages. Um, I, I'll move House File 575 be, be re-referred to the uh, General Register. Um, Benjamin, you want to take the roll? Yes. Chair Nelson? Aye. Vice Chair Carlson? Carlson, aye. Representative Nash? Nash, aye. Representative Bonner? Representative Drezkowski? Aye. Representative Elkins? Aye. Representative Greenman? Aye. Representative Cleborne? Aye. Representative Kosnick? Kosnick, no. Representative Mason? Aye. Representative New Brindley? Aye. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Representative Quam? Aye. Ayes have it, the motion prevailed. Thank you. Uh, the next bill we have is House File 702. It was Becker Finn, and it allows cities and towns that are allowed to require additional licensing for hotels. Um, I'll move House File um, 702 be re referred to the General Register. Um, Benjamin, you want to take the, the roll? Chair Nelson? Aye. Vice Chair Carlson? Carlson, aye. Representative Nash? 
Mr. Chair, before we proceed with the vote, you made a motion to refer to the general register. Did you mean to be re-referred to committee? House file 702, these are all to the general register. This is where they came from. They came back to us from the general register. Uh, Nash votes aye. Representative Bonner? Representative Jostkowski? No. Representative Elkins? Aye. Representative Greenman? Aye. Representative Cleborn? Aye. Representative Kosnick? No. Representative Mason? Aye. Representative New Brindley? Aye. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Representative Quam? No. Ayes have it, the motion prevails. The next bill we have is House File 1350, 1350, a Bolden bill. And uh, there's a, a technical amendment we have for this, which is basically just changing the dates, the effective dates on this to make it uh, uh, effective. Instead of effective 2021, there are three places it would be effective 2022. Um, on page one, line 23, Page, uh, page two, line 16, and page two, line 29. Again, all three of them, it's changing 20, 2021 to 2022. Um, I have moved uh, the technical amendment for House File um, 1350. It's the A15 amendment. Um, remember, we have to take, can we do the amendment with just a voice vote, Amanda? Are you shaking your head? Yes, I. I will just yeah, take take a voice vote on this. All in favor? Uh, Representative Kosnick. Uh, yes, Mr. Yeah. Chair, you can. I, I didn't mean to interrupt this particular motion, uh, but before we vote on the final bill, can you just give a brief explanation of what it is for our viewing public? Yes, I will do that. Yes, I like. Um, so let's put the amendment on first. All in favor of the H, fifteen, the A fifteen amendment? Please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. And House File 1350 is the cities of the first class are provided the authority to impose ordinance on land or data fee dedications on permit applications is what the bill does. And again, the amendment just changed the date, the effective date to, uh, on it. Um, again, Representative, Representative Kwame, you got, you got, oh, that's, that's my, never mind. That's my pointer turned into a hand. Um, um, Mr. Brinkman, you want to take the, uh, Mr. Brinks, you want to take the, uh, the roll on the bill. Again, the motion is to move House File 1350, I'll, I better make the motion. House, the motion is to make House File 1350 as amendment, move it to the general register. Mr. Chair Brinks. Nelson. Aye. Chair Nelson. Aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Uh, Carlson, aye. Representative Nash. Nash votes no. Representative Bonner. Representative Dreskowski. No. Representative Elkins. Aye. Aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Representative Cleborn. Aye. Representative Kosnick? Kosnick, no. Representative Mason? Aye. Representative New Brindley? No. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Representative Quam? Yet. That's a no. Let's have it, the motion prevails. Thank you, members. And then the next bill we have is House File 1359, Freiburg Bill. I'll move that we re-refer it to the General Register. And uh, Mr. Brinks, you wanna take the roll. And again, this bill is a towns and political subdivisions authorized to establish inflow and infiltration prevention programs 
and makes loans or grants to the property owners. That's what the bill does. Chair Nelson. Aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Carlson, aye. Representative Nash. Nash, no. Representative Bonner. Representative Dreskowski. No. Representative Elkins. Aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Representative Cleborn. Aye. Representative Kosnick. No. Representative Mason. Aye. Representative New Brindley. No. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, aye. Representative Quam. Aye. The ayes have it, the motion prevails. Thank you, Mr. Brinks. Uh, the next bill we have, this is the last one we have to re-refer, is House File 1863. It's a long bill, um, Representative Long bill. Um, its major parties are permitted to file a petition to prevent improper designation by candidates' names on an official ballot. Um, Mr. Brinks, do you want to take the roll? And I can actually I move, I move, I move that we refer, re refer this to the general register. Mr. Brinks. Chair Nelson. Aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Nelson, aye. Representative Nash. Nash, no. Representative Bonner. Representative Dreskowski. No. Representative Elkins. Aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Representative Cleborn. Aye. Representative Kosnick. Pass. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Representative aye. New Brindley. Aye. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, aye. Representative Quam. Aye. I just have it, the motion prevails. Um, Rep Representative Kosnick, did you want to vote or you still want to pass? Kosnick votes no. Thank you. Thank you. And that's the end of the bills that we have, the old bills that we have to dispose of. Um, the next bill on our, on our agenda is House File 2577, Representative Schultz. And I will move that House File 2577 be referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, Representative Schultz, you want to present your bill. Thank you, Chair Nelson and members of the committee. Welcome back, everyone. Um, House File 2577 is a simple bill that puts inflation back into the spending portion of our budget forecasts. And this is a bill um, that I've carried since 2015 and before me, represent, former Representative Paul Rosenthal carried and was a champion of. Um, in 2002, the legislature voted to take, remove the estimated inflation from our spending forecast. Um, and I think it's time that we restore it. The public desperately wants honesty and truthfulness um, from their elected officials. And when we do not consider inflation in the spending side, we're misrepresenting what a surplus or potential deficit really is. And this is dangerous because then legislators um, and interest groups and others have an expectation that in this instance that our surplus is larger than it really is. So when we include inflation in this surplus, um, it's really uh, over a billion dollars less than the 7.7 .7 billion that keeps getting reported by the media. So we really need to restore this because we do count um, increased income and tax revenue from inflationary pressures on the revenue side, but currently we do not consider expected inflation on the spending side. Um, and this is not just my opinion. The Minnesota Council of Economic Advisors, this is a group of private sector and academic economists, and they advise um, the governor's office and MMB to do sound budget forecasting. This is their quote that I think has been in every um, budget e economic MMB forecast since 2002. 
So every year um, since that change, the council has recommended that budget planning estimates for the next biennium include expected inflation in both spending and revenue projections. Council members noted that Minnesota's current practice of excluding projected changes in the prices of goods and services from a majority of the spending estimate is fundamentally misleading. It is inconsistent with both sound business practices and CBO methods, the Congressional Budget Office, and potentially encourages legislators and the public to regard the state's financial position more optimistically than the facts warrant. This distortion has increased in importance as inflation has risen this year and its future path is uncertain. The omission of inflation in the spending estimates in the November 2021 budget and economic forecast underrates the, under, understates the cost of maintaining current service levels as provided by law in fiscal year 24-25 by roughly $1.165 billion. And because inflation has accelerating, this bias in these estimates exacerbates the problem. Um, and so I, I have a few testifiers that I'd like to hear from today. And that, then I think we also have the MMB budget director, um, Mingi is also here to answer questions and to testify. And on the list, I've got, uh, on the, got three testifiers on my list. Um, do we wanna save the, Ms. Mingi for last, or do we want her to go first? Jet, Mr. Mitt, right? I think, la I think last, Mr. Chair. Okay, then I'll start with Clark Goldenrod. Um, welcome to the committee, and please identify yourself for the, the tape, and you can begin with your testimony. Hey, uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify. Uh, good morning, my name is Clark Goldenrod, and I'm the Deputy Director at the Minnesota Budget Project. The Minnesota Budget Project is an initiative of the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, and we identify and promote policy solutions that expand opportunity and economic security to all Minnesotans. I want to thank Representative Schultz for bringing this bill forward. We strongly support uh, House Bill 2577, and I'd uh, like to name two reasons why. So first, including inflation in the forecast makes the forecast a more effective tool that gives policymakers, stakeholders, and the public a clear understanding of the state's fiscal health to make them help them make better decisions. And second, making this change is good fiscal management and consistent with recommended accounting practices. So to that first point, uh, the state's budget and economic forecast are an essential tool for understanding the state's fiscal health. To be effective, forecast should be complete and give an accurate picture of the state's commitments. The state's forecast should give the public and you as the policymakers better information about the long-term impacts of the decisions that are being made today. The effects of inflation are real and this bill would ensure that the forecast includes an estimate of the impact of inflation on current expenditures and moves us toward these goals of a complete and accurate forecast. And then that brings me to my second point that making this change reflects good fiscal management and is consistent with recommended accounting practices. So as Representative Schultz mentioned, every year since 2003, our state's uh, Council of Economic Advisors has recommended that the state's forecast planning estimates include inflation in both spending and revenue projections. They note that our current forecast methodology is uh, quote inconsistent with both sound business practices and congressional budget office methods. The policy change contained in House Files 2577 has also been recommended in reports uh, such as the state's bipartisan uh, budget trend study commission, which was charged with ensuring budget stability back in 2009. That commission recommended that financial forecasts should be based on current law and inflation or deflation of both revenues and expenditures to provide an accurate planning perspective. And it's important to note that what this bill would not do. It does not make any budget decisions itself. The legislature would still have to approve an inflationary funding increase in a non-forecasted program or service, but you would have the necessary information to help you make those decisions. It's important to use all the information available to successfully craft and evaluate budget decisions and including inflation, that toolkit makes good sense. So thank you uh, for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Ms. Goldenrod. Um, we'll take questions at, after the te all three testifiers. The next person I have on my list is Eric Bernstein. 
Um, welcome to the committee and please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, Chair Nelson, members of the committee, um, my name is Eric Bernstein uh, and I am policy director at We Make Minnesota, which is a coalition of labor and community groups working towards a stronger and more equitable Minnesota. I'm here today in support of HF 2, uh, 2577, which would direct Minnesota management and budget to account for inflation in its budget forecasts. Current law forbids this practice and directs MMB to forecast expenditures based on current prices. This is unrealistic since prices rise each year as do the salary needs of public sector workers. Failure to account for the increased price of current level public services results in an effective budget cut every year. Furthermore, because inflation is naturally baked into the revenue side of MMB's forecasts, ignoring the impact of inflation on the expenditure side results in an overestimation of our budgetary solvency when lost spending power of public institutions is reported as net savings. Accounting for inflation in budget forecasts is the common sense approach to responsible budgeting, and it should be standard practice. But before diving a little further into the merits, I wanted to say a few words on inflation in general. Although highly politicized, inflation is not the great villain sometimes made out to be. Um, inflation is most often a result of a growing economy. So while we might not like paying a little bit more for groceries, it's far preferable to deflationary trends that result in recession, mass unemployment, and shuttered businesses. The ability of prices to adjust to changing demand and shifting consumer um, preferences is a basic function of a market economy, and it is a reality we cannot avoid by ignoring. Thankfully, to the extent we are concerned about the pocketbooks of regular Minnesotans, there's much the legislature can do to make life more affordable. In discussing inflation, the news media often highlights the changing price of milk and other consumer goods, but these small ticket items are not the major constraint on Minnesota families. Housing alone makes up more than 30% of all household expenditures, healthcare another 8.5%, and transportation 10%. Um, that's about half altogether. What all of these major cost centers have in common is that they are heavily influenced by public investment and regulatory decisions made at the state level. So the state can help keep these expenditures in check by subsidizing the construction of affordable housing, offering transportation alternatives, and keeping healthcare costs in line. And of course, real wage levels have much more to do with workforce and education policies we set than the changing price of a Ford Fiesta from Hertz Rent-A-Car. I wanted to add these broader notes um, because I believe that understanding inflation as a healthy, natural ebb and flow is important for informing how Minnesota approaches inflationary matters in the budget. Seeking to battle inflation by ignoring its effects on public services and allowing funding to decline over time will not make regular Minnesotans better off. In fact, ignoring inflation pushes increased costs onto cities, counties, and school districts that are then forced to raise levies and fees in order to make up the difference. This results in greater geographic inequity and shifts the burden onto property owners. It would be much better to get an honest picture of state costs and savings and then decide what funding increases um, are needed. Ignoring the impact of inflation, of course, results in the deterioration of public services over time. For example, in 2020, Minnesota schools um, estimate that they received 10% less inflation adjusted per pupil funding than they did in 2003, with similar or greater deficits in most of the years in between. Unable to keep up with baseline costs, schools cut programs, reduce staff, and postpone maintenance. Uh, importantly, declining budgets do not just hurt once, but compound over time as forestalled investments metastasize into crises, such as the staffing shortages um, being felt across the state right now. Similar challenges are found in many other public sector areas, such as transportation infrastructure, where project backlogs turn routine upkeep today into far pricier, heavy repairs down the road. Ironically, such funding failures may even increase inflationary pressure as dilapidated roads and struggling schools gum up the works of our economy. Fewer workers and a less efficient supply chain means more dollars bidding up the price of fewer goods and services. So whether through higher property taxes, lost services, or a slower economy, regular Minnesotans bear the cost when we fail to maintain the basic public investments that keep our state running. HF 2577 will not immediately fix all of our budgetary challenges, but it will keep it will help keep policymakers. Um, it will help policymakers more clearly consider the needs of our state agencies and the resources at our disposal. I hope you'll consider this bill as a good measure of honest housekeeping that will make us all better off. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bernstein. And now the next, the last person I have on my list here is Anna Mingi. Um, please state your name and uh, identify yourself for the tape and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, I'm Anna Mingi, State Budget Director and Assistant Commissioner at Minnesota Management and Budget. Um, good morning, Chair Nelson, members of the committee. 
Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, MMB supports including inflation in the expenditure forecast um, in the state budget forecast, which is in line, as you've heard, with our forecast for state revenues. We think that inflation is an important factor in presenting a reliable picture of the costs and revenues the state can expect in future years. Uh, as required under Minnesota Statute 16A.103, the state expenditure forecast does not currently include an allowance for inflation. And the result of that is that the forecast of state spending is not adjusted to reflect increased costs of maintaining services in future years. There are several exceptions to this treatment um, in places where state law accounts for price price growth in payment formulas, such as special education, nursing facility payments, and property tax refunds. There are also some places where it wouldn't make sense to imply inflation, such as our debt service forecast. As you've heard, the revenue forecast does reflect the impact of inflation. And because of the different treatment, um, growth, in price, growth in prices increases our projected revenues. But on the other side of the budget, the expenditure forecast um, does not reflect those additional costs. This understates likely future spending because price increases can result in higher costs and the erosion of um, program its ability to deliver services. As a result, of, as you've heard, the forecast could project a surplus, but ignoring but ignore future likely spending increases. This imbalanced view is only appreciated by those familiar with the intricacies of the state budget and is not well understood by a broader audience. As um, Representative Schultz stated, MMB's Council of Economic Advisors has repeatedly recommended that inflation be added to the expenditure side of the budget forecast. Um, they state that the practice of excluding projected changes in the price of goods and services is fundamentally misleading. As of the November forecast, we estimate that inflation, or including inflation in the expenditure forecast, in the 24-25 biennium would add $1.165 billion in additional spending over the current um, planning year's estimate. This estimate is calculated by applying projected um, CPI growth, 2.2% in 2024 and 2.2% 2 .2 in 2025 over the current planning estimates. As you've heard prior to 2002, MMB's budget and economic forecast did include an estimate of inflation on the expenditure side. At that time, the impact was included in years without an appropriated budget. Um, for example, in this, um, if we applied that practice right now, that would be applying it to 24 or 25. The forecast referred to it as discretionary inflation. And as that term implies, it represented spending, um, spending increases that weren't in required by law, but rather it reflected the impact of price increases on government operations. Um, the estimate was calculated by applying CPI to most general fund spending, and it was reported on a separate line or column in MMB's forecast documents. In 2002, the legislature amended 16A to strike the language requiring the inclusion of inflation in the spending forecast. And this bill undoes the changes that were made in 2002. Uh, as you might imagine, there are a lot of factors uh, that go into determining how to include inflation in the forecast, which programs to apply it to, which years, and which measure of inflation. Um, th that's a lot that we are happy to talk about further with members of the committee or um, with, with the bill author. Uh, I'm, uh, as I mentioned, really appreciate the opportunity to discuss the important issue, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Mingi. Um, members, I see we have one hand up. Any questions? Uh, and I'll start with Representative Elkins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, question for uh, Ms. Ms. Mingi. So you mentioned that uh, you know currently with the budget projections, I know that there's a, a footnote. I think former Representative Lincheski was responsible for that, but I think you're indicating that uh, for the, the current uh, inflation um, footnote, which is a little over 1.1 billion this year, that it's at this point fairly broad brush. It's uh, application of the consumer price index. If this bill were to pass, though, I, I'm guessing that you'd uh, you know um, 
do a much finer uh, projection of, uh, of inflation because CPI really isn't the most appropriate measure of inflation for a lot of government service there are services. There are other price deflators that would be more, impro more appropriate for things like uh, government salaries, especially things like, like teacher salaries. I think you correctly noted that uh, um, it wouldn't make sense to apply any kind of an inflation uh, adjustment to uh, to debt because the, the price of debt is set at the time you sell sell the bonds. But can you go into a little bit more detail about you know how if if this law passed, um, you would ap apply the appropriate measures of inflation for each, to each category of costs? Ms. Mingi, I'm Chair Nelson, Representative. This, um, as I mentioned, this bill undoes the changes that were made in 2002. Um, one, one interpretation of that would be that we return to the pre-2002 methods, which was similarly broad brush applying CPI to state general fund spending. Um, however, there is a requirement that MMB consult with the legislature on how to apply, um, how to make that inflation calculation. And so I, I can't um, necessarily predict how we would how we would land. Okay, thank you, Rep Representative Elkins. Any other questions? I'll give it a second here in case somebody wants to raise their hand. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker or Mr. Mr. Chair. I, don't, I, I didn't mean to promote you, Mr. Chair, but um, uh, maybe it was appropriate for today. Um, <laughs> Mr. Just a question, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm trying to remember back to last session, but is our budget set for the biennium? Um, Representative Jaskowski, I believe, yes, it is um, set for the current biennium. Um, and if we do nothing, um, <laughs> If we, if we do nothing this session as far as supplemental budget or any tax tax cuts on the, on the in the revenue department, um, our budget is set for the through this year through next actually next June. Representative Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, that's what I thought I remembered that um, that government is fully funded through June 30th of 2023. So um, thank you for verifying that. And uh, that's helpful as we look through this session and the bills like this one that uh, that aim to come before us um, to do things to affect budgeting when indeed our budget is fully set, government is fully funded. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Mason, you had your hand up. Did you still wanna speak or? Actually, I do. I just, uh, just to comment that I just never understood how this was passed in the first place. And I know we have a good explanation for it, but to me, this is just being deliberately dishonest or making it really difficult for us to do a good job. So I appreciate the, uh, I appreciate this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Mason. Any, for, any other questions? Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I was just going to make a quick comment as well. You know, um, as legislators, it is our job to um, make the hard decisions as we consider a budget. And part of that is that we get to choose. We, we see the budget forecast. Sometimes that comes in with a surplus. Sometimes that comes in with a deficit. But regardless of how that forecast comes in, it is our job as legislators to determine how those dollars will be spent. Um, that is perfectly accounted for in the current system and will be accounted for moving forward. I will be in a no vote on this, on this bill. Thank you, Representative New Brindley. Any further questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Chair? Sorry. Uh, Representative Elkins. Yeah, not uh, not a question, but a, a comment. I mean, I, I agreed with about the first three fourths of what uh, Representative New Brindley just said. Uh, ultimately, it is up to the legislature to determine the, the spending levels. Um, if this bill passes, it, it 
doesn't do anything to uh, uh, detract from our ability to do so. All it does is provide us with accurate information to, as a, the basis for making those budget decisions we're making. Right now, every year without inflation included, we're presented with a, a rosy scenario uh, which colors the decisions we make. All this bill would do is give us more accurate uh, information with which we could make those decisions on a better informed basis ourselves. Thank you, Representative Elkins. Representative Quam, I see you put your hand up. Uh, yes, Mr. Um, Chair. Basically, when we see the budget forecasts and the updates, I also see where over the past uh, year or two, we frequently see a decrease in spending even though the inflation rate hasn't gone negative uh, during many of these time periods. So the accuracy of the forecast, et cetera, et cetera, uh, doesn't seem to track spending with the uh, projected or accepted level of inflation. So therefore adding more variability into the numbers plus i rarely see any government projections taking into account the efficiencies that uh, most of uh, uh you know the economy see with innovations and in technology um you know maybe if our websites worked a little bit better we might see that but um i think this isn't quite uh ripe for uh, us to support thank you Thank you, Representative Quam. Uh, Representative Greenman, I see you have your hand up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Schultz, for bringing this bill. Because, you know, I think um, when I've, I I'm new to the legislature, and I was surprised that inflation wasn't uh, uh, baked into our um, our projections. You know, Minnesotans don't get to choose whether inflation is baked into their their prices and costs, and it feels like we shouldn't either. So, making sure that we have the um, the accurate data when we're making uh, uh, decisions just feels common sense. And, and um, I would hope that we would all support that uh, approach. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Greenman. Any further questions or comments? Uh, if not, uh, Representative Schultz, if you want to wrap up, then yep. we can get to a vote. Representative Schultz. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Nelson and members of the committee for hearing this bill. I just want to point out in your committee uh, materials, there are uh, two letters. One letter, they're both published in the Star Tribune. One was from, from, from former five former Minnesota Finance Commissioners who served in the DFL Republican and Independence Party governorships under different governors, um, wrote a letter in support of putting inflation back into our spending forecasts. Um, and they note that, um, as Representative Anu Brinley mentioned in the beginning of her comments, that nothing automatically happens just because we put inflation back into the state budget forecast. It just, the forecast is just a reference for us legislators um, to make responsible appropriation decisions when we do decide. So I encourage you to read that letter. There's also a letter from um, um, a former member of the Minnesota Council of Economic Advisors, William Melton, who was the chief economist for um, American Express Financial Services in support of putting inflation back into our spending forecast. Um, and so I think I encourage you to read that if you're um, still opposed to this, this bill. We have experts recommending this. And I believe we're the only state that does not include inflation in our spending, but we include it in our revenue side. So members, I encourage a yes vote on this bill. Thank you. With that, um, Mr. Brinks, if you want to take the roll. Uh, I'll, first, I'll renew my motion that House File 2577 be referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Mr. Brinks, take the roll. Chair Nelson votes aye. <coughs> Vice Chair Carlson? Carlson, aye. Representative Nash? Nash votes no. Representative Bonner? Representative Drezkowski? No. Representative Elkins? 
Aye. Representative Greenman? Aye. Representative Cleborn? Aye. Representative Kosnick? Kosnick, no. Representative Mason? Mason, aye. Representative New Brindley? No. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Representative Quam? No. So I have it, the motion prevails. Thank you, Mr. Brinks. Um, with that, thank you, Representative Schultz. The next bill we have on our agenda is House File 2545, and it's a Representative Lee bill. Uh, Representative Vang is going to present it for him because Representative Lee, uh, capital investment is already is meeting at the same time, and he's chairing that committee. Um, so welcome to the committee, Representative Vang. Um, I will move House File 2545 to be uh, referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, Representative Vang, present your bill. Thank you, Chair Nelson. And there is an amendment to the bill too. I, do you want me to put that on first or do you want to explain the bill first? Yes, please. Move the, uh, if you can move the amendment first. Um, there's a House file or there's a technical amendment, the H2545A1 amendment. Um, I'll move the A1 amendment. Um, all members in favor say aye. This is to put the bill in the order that the chair or the, the member wants. Um, all in favor, please unmute and say aye. 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 Opposed, unmute and say no. Ayes have it. Um, Representative Vang, present the bill, please. Thank you, Chair Nelson, and good morning to members of this committee. Um, I'm testifying on behalf of Representative Lee. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward bill. It's appropriating 233000 in uh, 2023 and ongoing to the Legislative Coordinating Commission to provide translation services. Uh, before I let my testifier, Michelle, speak on the details of this bill, I want to share why it's important to support this bill. Uh, being born and raised in a multilingual family, I've always grown up seeing my mom take letters she received in the mail to a local organization or a friend to help translate what the letter read. Today, it is me reading those letters for her. Some may think, well, she should have learned English all these years, in which she did. She can better understand English when someone is talking to her and she can respond much better, but the English that's formal and technical in a letter isn't as easy to understand. I'm sure the kind of English we use in our legislative body isn't the kind that even everyday people will, would understand either. So imagine how much more difficult it will be for a non-English speaker to understand the work that we do at the legislature. Uh, we all believe that government should serve all peoples, regardless of how fluent they are in English or not, and this bill improves language access. Uh, and it is intentional on engaging communities most often left out of the work that we do here. And so with that, I will pass it to my testifier, uh, Michelle, to um, give her testimony. Uh, welcome to committee. I have uh, Michelle Weber. Uh, you want to identify yourself for the record and proceed with your, your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Michelle Weber with the Legislative Coordinating Commission. Last year, Representative Lee reached out to the LCC to discuss the possibility of having the LCC coordinate both written and spoken translation services on behalf of the Minnesota legislature. This would be a new responsibility for the LCC and currently there are not resources available for this purpose. The funding in the bill would be utilized to hire part-time staff to provide written and spoken translation services in Hmong, Spanish, and Somali. The funding would also provide some limited funding to assist with translations in other languages through the Department of Administration master contract process. Uh, translation services would need to be limited to official legislative business and could not be used for campaign related activities. Mr. Chair, I'm happy to answer any questions that the members may have. Thank you, Ms. Weber. And uh, members, um, as uh, Representative Vang said, her parents, but my grandfather, grandmother came over from Sweden. They didn't speak a word of English when they first arrived either. And if we go back to the beginning of the last century, early 1900s, um, you know, 19s, um, 
we used to publish, the, the state used to publish things in many different languages. Uh, Representative Nash, do you want to go first or uh, you want to go last? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just make a, a brief comment. Um, to Representative Vang, and I know this isn't your bill, but you seem very well versed on it. Uh, I serve on the Council of Asian Pacific Islander Minnesotans, and I understand the challenge that many have. And I'm not unsupportive of this effort, but why is it that this was not put into a regular budget request, particularly last year? Was it a timing issue or or, or what? Uh, and maybe Ms. Weber could answer that. Um, I'm just curious because I, I do see the, the need and the value. Uh, and actually would be supportive of expanding it for people who um, are visually impaired. Um, Mr. Heller regularly makes requests for help on readability of documents. So I'm just wondering uh, if you could address that. Maybe, Mr. Chair, you could take a swing at that after uh, Representative Vang. Oh, Representative Vang. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Nash, for uh, your question. Uh, I, to be quite frank, I don't necessarily know why. Uh, I, I believe um, my testimony, Michelle, may have more context. Uh, this is a bill that uh, Representative Lee carried, and um, I didn't quite ask him. Uh, uh, I, I did ask him if this is the first time he's here. Uh, he's having a hearing on this bill, and he said yes. And so I didn't ask why it's the first time. Um, and so I can re refer that to Representative Lee to have a much more uh, better response to your question. Oh, and Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Yeah, Weber, did you did you all want to answer? Um, Mr. Chair, I can uh, provide the committee with some information about timing of the conversations with Representative Lee. Um, he did approach the LCC after um, in into last year's legislative session just to discuss this idea. It's my understanding that currently. In the house, some of the services are provided by um, staff who are multilingual, um, and, and and so I think it was in recognition of um, not having a comprehensive and and um, thorough resource available to all members of the legislature for this. So the bill was introduced later last year during um, during session. And Representative Nash, if, uh, you asked if I would comment. I think it's the, from looking at the number on it. I think it happened at late in at late in session, and we were well on down the track of, of the budget. And that's why it didn't get heard last year in committee. Representative Nash. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And that's kind of the answer I was I was uh, heading towards. It sounds like it didn't make deadline. Um, was introduced after third deadline or somewhere in that vicinity. Uh, certainly understand that I, and I'm supportive of of the effort. But I I do, I do think that uh, you know it's something that could have been included in your in your budget bill, Mr. Chair, uh, had it been brought a little earlier. I I I think that there is value in this. I think there is value in um, addressing a larger readability translated documents for um, all people. Yeah, who are uh, citizens and and doing uh, business here in the state of Minnesota as it relates to uh, what comes out of the legislature. Serving on the the technology advisory committee, we we do talk about these things, and I I, I am a little hesitant to to spend money after we did our budget bills last year, but I certainly understand um, the the impetus in this. So. Um, Again, Mr. Chair, I, I appreciate your insight into this, and we'll let others ask questions. Thank you, Representative Nash. Uh, Representative Quam, I see your hand is up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, those that have been around, uh, sometimes I've voted in, I think, 17 or 18 were the most different languages I voted in when we've done amendments in some committees. <laughs> and um, one of my school districts, has about a hundred different languages spoken in the homes. Uh, but I just wanted to thank the chair for uh, translating the one vote this morning. And uh, um, I think it's important that we realize uh, there's a lot of uh, different um, languages, a lot of different people that have come to Minnesota. And that's part of the reason why we 
are so good at so many things. And I like the intent. Um, I think there could be some improvements, um, but uh, I like the intent. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Quam. Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, just to, I, I guess, just to comment, um, I, I think that's the, the, the thread is, is the same here. Um, there's certainly merit in this bill. Unfortunately, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a priority in last year's budget. Um, there's a chance that it would be in next year's budget. Uh, and so for Representative Lee, uh, you know, bring that, bring that bill again next January when that budget cycle starts and those decisions will happen. And, and hopefully if it's a good bill, uh, it can be uh, in the upper end uh, of the decision making so that uh, there is a priority. So it sets uh, the priority or becomes a priority and is funded. Um, the reality is that, that uh, we already did that for this biennium. Government's fully funded and uh, we're done with that decision and it's time for us uh, to move forward. Uh, to pass a redistricting bill and do the things we have to do here this session. So um, again, merit in the bill, um, but uh, government's fully funded. This is not the right time to bring this forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Skowski. Uh, Representative Kosnick, and I suppose you're gonna talk about Norwegian. Representative <laughs> Kosnick. <laughs> no, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm Maybe I'm a little out of practice here, but I was trying to look up at the bill here uh, as we, we went and I didn't see the specific languages uh, that were mentioned in the testimony in the bill. Uh, was I missing that or or not? Um, Representative Vang, I'm, 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 when I looked at the bill, I, did, I don't think they do specific languages. Um, Representative Vang, do you have any insight on that or Ms. Weber? Representative Vang? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I believe we kept it um, in general, uh, as we know that there are um, various uh, communities uh, of, with, who speaks multiple languages. Uh, I know that um, Michelle has talked about specifically Hmong, uh, Somali, and Spanish, which the most common um, uh, second language is spoken here in the uh, in Minnesota. And so, you know, over time, I believe that also changes um, as we. Um, continue to change uh, in terms of demographics and population over the years as a state. And so um, I, I think it's also a long-term vision uh, to continue to provide translation services outside of just uh, Hmong, Spanish, and Somali. Representative Kosnick, I know, I know back to when my grandparents came here, there was Norwegian and Swedish and German were probably the three most spoken languages outside of English. And again, as Representative Bang mentioned, that, that does change as the different groups that have come to the United States. And I, I don't know if these are the three languages that are probably most prevalent now or not. That's, that I'm assuming that's what they, why those were the, were the three that were mentioned. Representative Kosnick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Bang. Thank you for the explanation. And I appreciate the intent of what the bill is uh, trying to accomplish and, and serve. Uh, I just have some reservations about the, the way it would actually uh, work and such. So, but thank you for answering the questions. Um, I won't be supporting it at this time. Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Representative Zang. Uh, I'm wondering, I, I'm sort of surprised to hear um, the issue of cost uh, come up, uh, given that we have a, a uh, seven billion dollar deficit, and I've heard some of the uh, um, priorities uh, coming from the other side. A 2.7 billion dollar uh, bailout on on corporate UI, and so I'm wondering, um, do we know how much this bill uh, would cost in 2023? Well, Representative Vang, I think if we refer to the to the amendment, it's that we put on. Um, there's the cost is in the amendment, um, Representative Vang. Okay. That's correct, Mr. Chair. It's uh, appropriating two hundred thirty-eight thousand. Representative Greenman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think when we have a, 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 a seven billion dollar uh, surplus, uh, the idea that we would not spend two uh, uh, three, uh, 
$233,000 to ensure that um, that folks uh, um, have what they need and can get what they need in the language they need it from our government um, just doesn't uh, doesn't really feel like it flies. Um, and I uh, hope that we would invest the um, that before we talk about some of these other uh, uh, priorities. Thank you. Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and to my colleagues that uh, are saying, well, let's just spend the money. I certainly understand your desire to do things like this, uh, particularly when there is a, a budget surplus. But let's remember the process we went through last year. Last year was the budget year. We created the budget. We, we hammered out the budget uh, for many hours. Uh, Chair Nelson and Senator Kiffmeyer eventually came to an agreement for uh, the purview of this committee's budget. And now we are effectively into a policy year. And I, I certainly understand the, the ease and desire to uh, spend cash that you, you believe is just sitting around doing nothing. But I would remind many of you that that's not the government's money. That money came... Uh, out of the wallets, checkbooks, and purses of people who live in the state of Minnesota. And we have a process. The process is simple. If you have a, a budget request, if you have a funding request, you bring it in the first year of the biennium. That's how this works. And in the second year of the biennium, we deal with other things that um, will come up. But this is not the proper place for it. And, and whether we support it or not, or whether it's a great idea or not, I think that this is something that we need to be cognizant of, um, that it, it fell short of the deadline to be introduced and possibly included. So we bring it up the next biennium. It, it happens regularly, and this is not something that I'm gonna support, regardless of how I feel about its intent. Just from the pure process alone, I, I'm gonna be voting no. Thank you, Representative Nash. Um, any further questions or comments? And I'll just wait here to make sure no hands pop up. If not, Representative Van, you want to do a wrap up of the bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, members of the committee, uh, for your support um, and consideration of this bill. Um, I just want to uh, conclude that uh, the opportunity to uh, invest and prioritize our communities is, is now, and this bill does that. Uh, there's nothing stopping us from funding this bill. Uh, and so I will just leave it with that and thank you all for your time. Thank you, Representative Vang. And with that, members, I will renew my motion that House File 2545, as amended, be referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, Mr. Brinks, do you want to take the roll? Yes, thank you. Chair Nelson. Aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Carlson, aye. Representative Nash. Nash votes no. Representative Boehner. Representative Drezkowski. No. Representative Elkins. Aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Representative Cleborn. Representative Cleborn, you, you were muted. Apologies. Cleborn votes aye. Thank you. Representative Kosnick. Sorry, I was muted. Kosnick, no. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Representative New Brindley. No. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, aye. Representative Quam. You're muted, Representative Quam. With that, the ayes have it and the motion prevails. Thank you, Mr. Brinks. Uh, members, Thank you for being attentive and, and hopefully we went, we got through this okay. This first meeting of this year, it's uh, getting back in the saddle and getting through the process. It's uh, sometimes we have a little, a few hiccups and headaches. 
Um, members, our next meeting is this Thursday, February 3rd. Uh, we, well, we're gonna have a presentation on the cybersecurity and broadband provisions that are in the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and how that, and how that might affect our committee. Um, with that, members, if there are any questions or comments from anybody, if not members, we're adjourned.